Hello, I'm Phil Svitek, 360 Creative Coach, and welcome to my blog, where it is both my mission and my pleasure to highlight my creative journey in hopes of inspiring you and giving you specific takeaway. All that way, your journey can be at least a little bit easier. Now, as I usually do, before I fully dive into things, I would love to invite you to subscribe if you haven't already, that we get all the various lessons and episodes that I put out right when I put them out. Thank you if you just did, and thank you if you already were. It truly does mean a lot to me, as I hope it does to you. So, uh, let's get into it, right? Um, you know, if you caught the last vlog that I posted, uh, creatively, I was talking about how I took a step back from writing uh, a script that I'm working on and went back to the outline. You know, in fact, uh, as I was looking at it, the outline hadn't been touched since um, March, right? Because ever since the outline got completed in March, I've been working on the script. And I've been th through a first draft of the script and have since then been revising it. But as I mentioned last week, it was just beneficial to take a more macro view and reassess kind of where things were. And I got to say, it's been really beneficial in that way because... You know, as you're writing a scene within the script, you get so lost in the details of, you know, who's saying what, who's doing what, the right words to use as far as the prose is concerned. And so you get bogged down. And of course, you have an idea of where you're going, but it could still be easy to get lost in it, right? And so... By going back to the outline, you know, I'm essentially taking what I've been writing and utilizing that to create an outline, which is great because, you know, <laughs> I essentially have a roadmap for the outline. But by doing so in, in the outline as I'm writing it, it allows me to look at everything and not have to worry about the details. I can just say, you know... I could just highlight what happens. And as long as there's a flow to it, you know, a causality, uh, the South Park writers, Matt and Trey, call it the, the but then. You know, they do this, but something happens. Then, because of that, they have to do X, Y, Z, right? And so it's much easier to see those connections. And it allows me to... Also, by the way, apologies for that. Uh, that is my foster uh, named Diamond. She's playing with her squeaky toy. And uh, I don't want to be a meanie and take it away from her. So I will allow her to continue uh, to make those noises as I continue to record. So uh, the point being that, you know, as I'm working on this outline, I'm working off of the script too. And so I can look at the scene and be like, okay, well, what is this? What is this really about? Because, you know, there's some stuff that's driving it forward. There's some stuff that's maybe shoehorned in and maybe stuff that, you know, in theory is nice, but can be completely cut. And so it allows me to reassess that and get down to brass tacks of what is this about? And by having to just literally type out what happens and not have to worry about the rest of it, it becomes much more smoother, right? And I can, you know, within a few sentences write an entire scene that in the script might be two pages three pages four pages and so it's a lot easier to think in that way and I can go back to earlier scenes and reference them easier um, and I don't have to sift through you know tons and tons of pages um, and all that stuff so it's, it's, it's been really beneficial now I'm about uh, halfway done. You know, I was hoping to be completely done, but, you know, it, it's, it's taking a little bit. Um, there's certain key specific scenes that, in theory, I knew what I needed to accomplish with them, but I didn't know how and, and how logically it kind of made sense within the universe. And this time around, as it's happening, you know, as with every revision you would hope, it just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And so 
you know, in this round of it, the various scenes that weren't working, so far I have been able to find solutions. Now, are there perhaps better solutions? Yeah, maybe, uh, probably. And I hope to discover those as it goes on. But so far, what I've kind of plugged into those holes has been working, right? So it's not terrible. Um, and it seems to work. So I'm very excited about that, that, you know, in many ways, whether or not the script is fully, like, to me, it's exciting, right? There's a lot of stuff going on and whatnot. So to me, there's, there's an excitement level and it's starting to make sense, right? And whatever shortcomings there are, again, that, that can be elevated as things go, go, go on. And one of the things that I men mentioned um, in my last vlog is I'm, one of the things that I'm utilizing is I essentially just write, you know, off the cuff of like, okay, what, what's going on? Like what's happening in the scene? Bare bones, terrible grammar and stuff like that. And just throw it into chat GPT to polish up. And I'll actually post a video um, this, this week um, how I'm doing that to, to really illustrate that. So um, I'll link to it in the description as well so you can check that out. Um, and that's been really beneficial. Now, of course, I'm just utilizing it for the benefits of the outline. Um, it's not something that I I'm publishing. And even, even with the benefit of ChatGPT to clean up my crappy writing, um, you know, there's things that I still have to fix for the sake of, it just misinterprets what I'm saying. But that's a, in a way that's good because it allows me to see, okay, you know, what, what are things that, uh, that are confusing, right? Because if ChatGPT is confused by it, then potentially another person would be as well. So it offers that perspective in many ways. And that's good. And, and the goal of really utilizing it is to just continue working at the speed of thought. So the speed of thought is just putting out you know, in this case, thoughts onto the paper and seeing how they work, right? And so for me, I don't have to worry about the flow of the sentences as much, you know, uh, the, certainly not the grammar and, and things of that nature, the sentence structure, you know, chat GPT overall does that for me. Now, it also does get clunky or, you know, it'll turn what really needed to be one sentence into like, an entire paragraph sometimes. And I'm like, okay, none of this is necessary. It's certainly not for me and not an outline. So, you know, I'll just cut certain things. So it is interesting to see still the, not the shortcomings of ChatGPT because certainly I'm able to utilize it and it, and it benefits me, but how it, uh, how it works and how it doesn't work, right? You know, what it's good for and what's not. So that's another benefit of utilizing it in this way. And yeah, my, since I got about halfway through with this week with, with, the, with the script, or with the outline rather, um, my hope is by the end of this week, I can be fully done. Now we'll see because a lot of the early stuff I've had more time to work on, right? Anytime I revise a script, you start at the beginning, right? And so a lot of the beginning stuff has gone through more and more rigorous uh, protocol of my own. You know, the stuff that uh, remains follows all of this, but is a little bit more nebulous. And in fact, it's very interesting to compare this current outline to the one from March. Because the one from March had about 65, uh, you know, bulleted plot points, right? Because at that point, you know, I was still going through it and it just, you know, you're kind of focused on more of the, the, the big picture stuff because, you know, you don't have as many of the details. Now, the difference is, as I may mention, this time around, I have the script to go off of. Therefore, I can include 
more minor scenes and know what they're about and how they're driving the plot forward and include the details that I know I need to make note of for myself because they need to be included in the script because the audience needs to take note of it because it's going to um, matter for the purpose of the story, right? By the way, I do apologize. As I said, you know, I just don't want to... Um, she's enjoying herself uh, with a squeaky toy and uh, I just don't have the heart to, to take it away from her, although I understand admittedly how annoying that may be. But the point being that, yeah, the original March... Outline was about 65, you know, itemized scenes, um, details, whatever you want to call it. This time around, I'm already at 66. I'm, you know, about halfway through. Now, that doesn't mean I've necessarily expanded the story in terms of going from, you, you know, this, uh, you know, short film to a, a two-hour epic or something like that. It was always all there, but now I'm just getting granular, right, with each of the things. And and also for my benefit, I'm kind of breaking up, you know, certain sections. So, you know, whereas before, let's say the characters went, but uh, the characters were moving and um, all of a sudden, you know, like let's say... I don't know. I'm just going to make something up like that. They entered this portal, you know, let's imagine like the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, like they, they entered through this portal. You know, I may have written that as like one thing, but instead I'll write like, you know, the, the, the kids entered the bedroom. Okay. So that's the scene, you know, whatever happens, they, they see this portal, they argue, should they go in? Should they not? And then they enter the portal. And so that'd be like one little bullet point you know, one numbered thing, and then the next thing would be once they're, you know, through the portal. Whereas before, I might have combined it, right? So that's partly a difference in having a lot more itemized things this time around, right? So I just wanted to kind of help clarify that as far as the journey is concerned. And the exciting part also is, you know, we're nearing the end of the initial character designs and um you know it's kind of coalescing all at the same time where we'll have those and ideally i can you know now i'll have the outline a much more sort of reflective version of it because that's the other thing like the outline it, it, it's so crazy going back to earlier outlines it's no different than like if you read earlier drafts of scripts uh for example with my second movie a bogota trip um, I had a chance to like, I don't know, just popped open, I forget exactly how, but, um, an early draft of the script and it's just like, wow, night and day of like, whoa, what the script was initially to, uh, you know, what the, what the final script ended up being, let alone the movie, because of course, uh, the movie itself changes even from the shooting script itself. Right. And that's the beautiful thing is that it's an exploration, right? This is art. Uh, it, it is that creative act, and it is, a, it is a journey, quite literally. But I'm excited because now we're at the phase where, you know, things are, as I said, coalescing all together. And, you know, the ideal for me would be we all can, you know, the, the, the creative group that I work with can look at the, the script and be like, okay, well, what needs work and, and what's working? And at the same time, we can all collectively assess the character designs and be like, okay, you know, what's working there and what do we need to revise and how do we move forward and things of that nature, right? Um, so that's been really fun to see. And, you know, there's, there's definitely scenes that regardless of what happens with the script that I know, like as far as locations and certain, uh, let's say, artifacts, they're just locked in, right? Like they're gonna, they're, they've been there since day one and they are not changing. And so, you know, we can work on those designs too as, as we move forward. So it just allows us to expand and, you know, uh, have the snowball effect, right? Where the snowball as it rolls down the hill gets bigger and bigger. And so in this sense, we can work on more things simultaneously. But as I've pointed out 
to, in many instances, nothing happens without the script. And so that's rightly been the focus. Uh, the other fun part of all of this, so in case you didn't know, this is intended to be an animated movie, um, which would help because you might be confused of like the character designs, although that could apply to live action as well. Uh, regardless, it's supposed to be an animated movie, and I love 2D animation. And I had uh, my friend Marissa Serafini wear two uh, movie buffs, and she came over and we watched... Princess Mononoke and Your Name. And Princess Mononoke is by Hayao Miyazaki, and it's a classic. And in fact, it's one of the inspirations for this movie. Um, and Your Name is a more modern classic, um, very well beloved. And, you know, she, she picked out both movies. And we didn't know initially that we we're going to watch both. But so we kind of joked about it, of like, oh, this is a real Sophie's choice of you know, which movie do we watch? Princess Monoki or uh, or Your Name? And, you know, we, we, we picked Princess Monoki because it's a classic and it's older and we figured, you know, start there. And uh, it was really wonderful to see the movie. Number one, because I upgraded my uh, entertainment system. So I had the surround sound, because before, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd seen it, I'd obviously never seen it in theater. You know, I've only ever seen it on, like, computer screens or, like, you know, TV sets and off of VHS and stuff like that. And this was a beautiful HD version of it um, in full 5.1 surround sound. And... It just looked gorgeous, right? And one, one of the things that I love, so Marissa, as I mentioned, had seen neither. I'd seen both, obviously. But there's just this, such a different experience when you watch a movie that you know with somebody who doesn't know the movie, right? Because you're essentially sharing your love of that movie with them. And Marissa, someone who loves animation like me, she likes anime, um, as well as all kinds of animation. But uh, it was just wonderful to see it through essentially her eyes. And, you know, be, be because not that you take the movie for granted. Obviously, like Princess Mononoke, I have a, a, a deep appreciation for. But watching it, I was reminded, like, I was like, oh, this, this is actually really dark. Um, you know, certain things that happen and, and, and whatnot. And just from a story perspective, yeah, I gained a deeper appreciation. I was able to notice new things. And that's why I, th I think it is important to share art, you know. Yes, art can be definitely experienced by yourself. But the experience of it is just so further deepened when you share it with somebody. And so that was beautiful. Um, you know, and then... We started pretty early, and so we got to the point, it was like, well, why don't we also just watch your name as well? And so we watched that, and it was very interesting to observe how far animation had come. So Princess Mononoke came out in 1997. Your name came out in 2016. Uh, and both gorgeous movies, right? But you could tell how computers could be utilized with 2D animation to make gorgeous imagery with your name. But either way, you know, I look at either one, and if I get anywhere close to the majesty of either with my movie, then I will be so happy. Mission accomplished. You know, that's that's my goal ultimately is to is to have the movie look good. And by that, I mean, you know, all the things. Um, cinematography, acting, music, editing. And if the story is enjoyable for people, then that to me is the success. That's what I'm going for. And so it was, re it was really cool to 
be inspired and, and watch both those movies in that fresh perspective through, through the lens of her eyes. Um, so really cool. A um, couple of other things in terms of the non-creative. Um, I saw this post on, on Instagram that was essentially talking about, let's raise kids who can name more plants and animals than celebrities and brands. And I thought that was just such an interesting notion that no one has ever succinctly put in that way that I'd seen. Because yeah, even even for me, it's like I definitely know a lot more celebrities and brand names than I do the names of plants and animals. And yet there's just something insidious about that regardless of whether or not I work in the entertainment industry or not. Um, so... Yeah, I, did, I just felt like that was an interesting notion and, you know, minus the raising of kids part, I think it just even applies to us in general of like, well, why don't we know more about nature and our world in general? Because I think it's important. We've gotten so detached, you know, from all these things. We don't know how most things work. We, we just kind of, even something as simple as like the food we eat, we just go to the grocery store and we expect it to be there. But the connection it has to other people and the land and how it interacts with the world, like, it's all just kind of lost on us, right? And we just don't have enough gratitude because we just don't have that understanding. It's a lot more easy to, to have gratitude for something when you understand it. And when you see, oh, wow, you know? So, I don't know. I just thought that was an interesting, cool notion. Uh, the other thing that's kind of been interesting to watch, not that I have solid thoughts on it quite yet, um, but this idea where I feel like younger generations will get to a point where they will vilify, and not necessarily unrightly, um, the heroes that perhaps I and others grew up with. So, for example, you know, seeing the backlash of Oprah and Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And if you're unfamiliar, they essentially, you know, initially posted that they were doing a fundraiser for the people of Maui and were asking for donations. And they've taken a lot of heat for this because in reality... Um, the main thing that most people are saying is we essentially don't have the money because we're poor ourselves and you two have the means to not only help fund a lot, but also you have millionaire and billionaire friends that you can ask more directly. And I think the more, certainly the more nuanced version of that too is they essentially created a fund where the money would go quote unquote directly to the people of Maui. But when you look at the fund itself there's a lot of overhead and the thing of it is there was already other um other ways to help directly to the people of maui and so you know it's just one of those things like you don't need to start your own thing a lot of times when something already exists just go support that and so there's been a lot of controversy and and things like that um you know there's been the whole Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis fiasco um, in in their support of you know their their co-star from that '70s show, um, and I won't get into the details of that. Drew Barrymore has recently taken heat because she was going to restart her show. She stood by the decision, and now recently she actually decided to change her mind and go back to having it be off the air while the WGA and Actors Guild um, strikes are happening. Bill Maher, someone, you know, he's going back with his show amid the strike and, you know, people are upset with him. And so it's just it's kind of interesting to see all this. And I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, but I think we will get to a place where a lot of you know, these people that we looked up to will start to become vilified. It's almost like that uh, Dark Knight quote 
you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. I, I really think that's kind of applicable here. But I think it, you know, beyond just the celebrity aspect of it, I think it speaks to a, a, a bigger aspect of it that none of us are perfect. And none of us, our records will be unblemished. Now, it doesn't necessarily make any person's wrong action right. But at the same time, it doesn't make them wrong people. We have to judge the action and not the person. I think that's sort of very important. and we, we, We've gotten away from that. So, I don't know. As I said, it's something that's been brewing in my mind and I, I've been considering and thinking about and I will want to introduce it here, but I think I definitely um, will have more and more thoughts as kind of it permeates in my mind. Uh, two other quick things that I wanted to mention. So uh, my friend Matt D'Andrea, a very close friend of mine, he launched a hard, sense, hard seltzer line called Bravago and they actually shipped to 38 states, and so it's a um, it's a hard seltzer. The, uh, I've had the chance to try out three flavors: um, Rainier Cherry, there's Vanilla Orange Cream, and Strawberry Lemon. My favorite is the cherry one, actually. Um, and I just want to kind of promote it. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I don't get any kickback from it. I hope by this point you know that. I just love supporting my friends and I love supporting people who do cool stuff um, and this combines the two. And so I just want to shout it out. You know, if you're someone that is looking for like a good hard seltzer, then, you know, try out Bravago. Um, you can check out more information by going to at Drink Bravago or uh, drinkbravago.com and yeah. Um, it is it is tasty, you know. Like I said, I like them all, but cherry for me was the most fun one. And yes, I also understand the irony of having talked about uh, that we should name more plants and animals than celebrities and brand names. And as I give you a brand name to remember, but all you know, it's okay to know those stuff too. But just also know the plants and animals, right? And I'm gonna, you know, actually make it a more of a focus. And that it's top of mind to, to kind of acclimate myself more to that. You know, it'll take time. I'm not saying it'll happen overnight. But I think that that's a worthwhile pursuit. And I don't know why. Um, so each year, one of the things that I do, thanks to um, Rachel Brathen, who hosts the show called From the Heart, um, at the end of every year, she does sort of, you know, closing out of the year ceremony and then prepares everyone for the new year. And part of the preparation for the new year is to pick a word that is gonna encompass the year. And I've, you know, if you've followed me for a number of years, I've talked about like what my word for each year is. This year it is enlightenment. And it's essentially to, to discredit every limiting belief that I ever have. Now, Part of doing that also means you face a lot of challenges. Like in many ways, I feel like I've invited a lot of challenges to test myself, you know, uh, knowingly and unknowingly um, by making that declaration. And so, you know, whether it means this or not, I don't know. But next year, I feel like I just want my word to be fun. <laughs> next year, next year is just going to be a fun year. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to just, you know, kick it and, and do nothing. But just really enjoy myself with the things that I'm, I'm doing and focus and, and, you know, ideally be in a position where I only do the stuff that is meaningful to me, right? And that I do enjoy doing. So we'll see how that all goes. But I'm declaring that intention already, you know, so um, hopefully, hopefully the universe receives that as much as I want to receive that. Anyway, that's... Uh, that's what I got for you this week. Thank you, as always, for taking the time to tune in. Uh, comment down below with any questions or thoughts on any of the stuff that I talked about or anything that you would love me to talk about for the future. 
you know, uh, happy, happy to do that. Likewise, you know, if you think I might be a benefit to you, consider joining my Patreon page. It's only ten dollars uh, a month, and there's only one tier, so everyone, you know, they don't feel like they're missing out on anything. Everyone gets the same thing, and it's where it allows for more direct interaction. You know, um, once a month I do a coaching session, and so I can you know, speak to you more directly and stuff like that. So um, if that's something you think you would like, check that out. Or of course, there is you know my coaching slash consulting services through my website, philsweetech.com as well. Anyway, I've yapped your ear off enough. Um, that's it for me, and I hope to see you next time.